I like to tell stories. As a kid, I loved to listen to stories. I would much prefer to listen to stories than to read them. my grandson and his babies. He's eight years old. He said to me, Grammy, don't you want to see my babies? I said, of course. He says, well, come on now. You got to take care of yourself. So that makes me fight every day to keep on going, just because he said that. Man, it was, it was heavy. It was mentally, it was very heavy for me. Because they said my kidney, the first thing I thought, I was going to die right away. I thought that for a year, that I was going to die right away. And I didn't know how to react, because when you're hit with something like that and they tell you, well, we're gonna take your vein and bring it up to the top of your skin so you can have the needles in, so your blood can go through the machine, it was like a mind blower. Then I found out I'm in end stage renal disease, and that's the last stop before I die, so that was a mind blower too. And then I, as I started going to this center and meeting the patients, it made me feel a little better eased up the tension in me. And I knew if I went every day and I seen different people, and I learned things. When I left the country in 67, I just never bothered to go to doctors after that. And so I, would, I got these signs, you know, that something was wrong with me, which I ignored beginning around 94. Um, and I think one of the reasons I ignored it is because when I left, stopped going to doctors in 67, the cures were almost as painful as the disease, you know. But uh, I found, much to my chagrin, when I started to go to doctors again, that it was so much less painful to go to a doctor uh, than it had been. But anyway, I resisted and I resisted. Uh, I resisted the blood clots coming out in my urine and everything. And uh, I resisted the blood clots coming out in my urine. And you were having blood clots? Yeah, yeah. You know, big thing. So what was that? Well, that was from the cancer that was developing in my bladder. And uh, so finally I stopped urinating altogether for maybe 12 hours. And my family, who, you know, I trust with these things, just said, you're going to the emergency room. And they took me to the emergency room. And people started to rush around me like I'd been shot. <laughs> and that was when I realized, oh, I must be really sick. <laughs> I'll tell you how I got on dialysis. My husband and I, our daughter sent us on, as a treat, on a, a trip to Rome for two weeks, you know, to see the Holy Father. Then we, he walked all over Rome and I had to take a nap. So when we came home, we got news that we were moving to this new apartment, which is located on 94th Street, right up the hill from dialysis. And we lived there, we were only there one month when he had his lung removed. He had cancer of the lung. So I was taking care of him and was totally unconscious of that I had, my kidneys were failing. But he died and was buried on a Monday, May the 3rd, and on May the 7th, I was in Mount Sinai on dialysis. That's, you know, that's when I found out my kidneys weren't working. My, my high blood pressure, uh, she's, my doctor said uh, my high blood pressure uh, was like causing it. She said, 
my sh uh, the, the 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 balancing that was how I peed and all that day, it wasn't coming out right, you know. Uh, that's why I'm do I do di I do dialysis. Before I had a car accident in 1996, where I did both of my hips, my clavicle and my lung collapsed. So I was at a Cabrini Hospital for uh, 10 and a half months. So when I came out of there, December of 1996, I came here, straight here. Basically, the story falls into three parts. There's the beginning of the story, there's the middle of the story, and there's the end of the story. An estimated 26 million people in the United States have chronic kidney disease, and of that number, about 400,000 have what's called end-stage renal disease. When patients hear the term end-stage renal disease, it can be a very scary word because when you think end stage, it means the end of the line, um, I'm gonna die. When in fact, end stage renal disease really just means that your kidneys no longer work well enough to clean your blood of toxins and that you need assistance. In the United States, most patients who are on dialysis are on hemodialysis, which involves going to a center, a dialysis center, where they get their treatment three times a week. And each treatment lasts anywhere from three and a half to four hours per treatment. And when you factor in the time it takes to get to the unit, to get put on the machine, and then they get taken off the machine and to leave the unit, it can sometimes take up to six or seven hours each time. I get up like, I get up uh, nine o'clock, clean up, wash up and everything. And uh, I, leave, I, I leave from upstairs for, for it's 11, I leave upstairs at 11 o'clock, stay downstairs, wait for the truck to 1.30, something like that. And at uh, 1.30 they pick me up or something like that. They pick me up like that. I usually get here about 4.30, 5 o'clock, because somebody's always not here for whatever reason. My um, shifts really, I'm on the fourth shift, which starts at 6 o'clock. But usually, if they're running you know, ahead of time, sometimes they can get you on by 5. You know, so. Now, my schedule is Tuesday, Thursdays, and Saturdays. And I'm here for three and a half, no, three hours and 45 minutes, which usually turns out to be more. The, when the first time I came here, it hurt. But after a while, you know, I had, I had, I had a thing up here. I had a thing, uh, yeah, I had a catheter up here. So, you know, they put these here after my catheter went, for, uh, went, for, went uh, bad. So I had to... You know they had to get they had to get this put this in there, and that you know I had no problem with, with it since. Hardest part about dialysis for the physicians is how to get someone's blood out of their body and through the machine and back into it, and an AV fistula uh, is the best vascular access for that. One hospital they want to chop up into my skin real quick because they told me my my kidneys they weren't bad then but they told me they were going and they wanted to chop into my skin right away. And I'm like, uh-uh, hold up, you gotta explain this thing to me before you start doing things like this. An AV fistula is when a surgeon takes an artery and a vein in your arm and connects them in such a way that the vein becomes large and easy for a nurse to put needles in so that the blood can be circulated through the machine. This, this is the fistula. So they went up in here and they started from underneath my armpit and they cut it and they put the artificial vein they brought my regular vein as close as they could to the skin. They put the artificial vein, excuse me, artificial vein into it. And that makes it easier for the, the needle to go into tubing. It's a, it's a plastic tubing, two of them, one here and one there. One is for the blood to go in, go up and around the tubing, go through the machine, go through the filter, and come back in here. And this, this is a stressful thing. A fish look, a fish look. And then, uh, like I said, it, was, it didn't hurt much. It was, hey, I, I, they put me to sleep <laughs> and I woke up and they still was working on my arm. <laughs> well, I don't know much about how the, the machine works except that it, it, you have two, you have two, uh, an, uh, an, an arterial and a venous artery. One takes your blood away and one returns it. 
you know, it's like a, it's like a cycle that takes the impurities out. And then before they start doing anything, they return your board to you. I, I always make sure they do that before I go home. Some of the checks really are very, very good. A couple of them that come, come and do my needles, you wouldn't even know you were get, getting the needle in your arm. So the needle's the worst part, you Yeah, well, I, I, all I do is make a funny face. You know, they tell you, oh, hold your breath. I said, no, I'm not going to hold my breath. I'll just make a funny face. So Jacqueline uh, self-cannulates. She puts her own needles in. Um, I'm a bit of a wimp. I don't know if I could uh, see myself doing that. Um, but home dialysis therapy, home hemodialysis therapy in particular, is something that's becoming more and more uh, kind of in vogue. And a lot of patients um, want to do their treatment not in a center, they want to do it at home in their own time, and want to place the needles themselves and, and have that element of control over their care. And I'm now going to canalize myself to show you guys how to do it. Okay, first you have to clean the spots, clean the areas real good. All right, I usually start with this one, with the three alcohol. I usually start with those and clean it. And I pour this on, because that's how we were shown to do it. Then I clean it off one more time with this one. Then I wipe it off, because the alcohol doesn't stick with the Band-Aid if the residue of the alcohol is still there. So that's why you wipe it, clean in the area. Then I have to open the needles. Okay. Um, this is for the arterial. The arterial is the bottom. It's the bottom, uh, what are these? Fistulas? No. Yeah, this is official. I call these humps. The bottom hump. Okay. This is the needle. There's a certain way you put the needle in. Okay, voila, it's in. Now I have to tape it. That's it, that's the first one. First one's done. Correct? Correct. Ooh, it's not hurting today. Stop. Awesome. This is a nice technician. So do you know how Zoom in on him. Do I know how the machine works? Yeah, how the yes. how, how does how does it work? Um, from what I've, what I've been told is, where does it start with the in, in arterial or the, it starts with the arterial, comes out, goes around, goes through the machine, goes through this, 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 goes through the filter thing, comes in, around, 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 and comes to the top one, right? Clearly when someone is on dialysis, it's a major lifestyle change. But it doesn't mean you have to stop doing what you love doing. You see, for me, the whole thing goes back to the campfire. You know, all the way back in primordial times, and somebody sat and told the story to the rest of the tribe and in the evening. So I start, that's, for me, that's where storytelling starts. And, uh, and now with a computer, you can, you can type as fast as you can think, but it doesn't have any poetry. It just blather. Um, so I encourage my students to write slower and to write in longhand. I believe there's a kind of a relationship that you have when you, that you get with your writing when you write longhand. It's different than the one that you get when you're typing or using the computer. Yeah, come in. We have many patients who start dialysis who continue to work as doctors, lawyers, uh, teachers or professors. We have patients who run daycare centers uh, who even uh, 
play in bands as musicians who travel uh, the world. Yeah. yeah. That's good. I like that. I like that. Yeah. It makes it very uh, conversational. Mm -hmm. That's what I was going yeah. for. Yeah. That's what you got. <laughs> Trying to go from yeah, yeah, poetic no, to that's, conversational. It's interesting. <laughs> a conversational third person, you know, mm -hmm. which is usually more formal. Yeah. But yeah, definitely. Still, but it worked. <clears throat> so that's fabulous. Okay. Um. <laughs> Anything else? Um, well, yeah. You said I, you're doing good? Yeah, Keep on going? I'm, I'm doing good. I have yeah, can you, like 30 yeah. something pages. <sighs> well, I'll see you this week. Okay, I'll see you later. <laughs> Thank Very you. good. That's fabulous. I think you had a breakthrough. It's, right. it's really going good. Thank you. Lots of struggle, <laughs> but you finally made it. So, you know, traveling is, is something we encourage and we embrace, and we love to help people to travel. Um, and we usually require some time. Uh, probably about four weeks, especially overseas, longer, um, because it, 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 it needs um, all kinds of coordination with the other unit. The medical records need to be um, sent over to the receiving unit. I mean, internationally, nationally, dialysis centers ex receive travel, uh, patients who travel. So. Um, so it's it's very known in the dialysis world. People travel and and are active. So um, and I, I I tease Peter because in my ten years that I have done this, I have never had such a complicated <laughs> travel um, uh, coordinating before. This year I went to uh, Spain, Germany. Uh, I'm getting ready to go to Finland in July, and then September we're going to Paris. And, you know, I go to California every other month, like, you know, we, we do that every other month. I play drums. I play um, with uh, this guy, they call him the king of Latin soul. His name is Joe Batan. He's been around for a while. going to California, Tokyo, and then another part of California. So things were going to be outdated by the time he was going to be in California, so there was a lot of, um, a lot of coordinating around his trip. And, and we did it, and we worked very closely together, the physician, the nurse, and myself, and, and we made it happen. So uh, he went to Tokyo, and I asked when he came back, how did you do? Did you love it? Did you have a great time? He said, the food was awful, you know? And <laughs> when you talk to him again about it, um, the food was bad, but he was the only person treating at the hospital in, in, this, in the center. When patients develop kidney failure and have to go on dialysis, dialysis is a way to clean their blood of the toxins that build up and remove the excess salt and water that builds up as well. But patients have to be active participants in their care. And the way they do that is to help manage their intake, their diet. Uh, most of these patients are diabetics, so they're already told they can't take in a lot of sugar. Uh, they tend to also have high blood pressure. You get, you get, you know, you know, you, know uh, you, get, you get tired of the diet, you know? You just feel like, you know, just chucking it. You know, my, di my diet, yeah, because I, Cause one diet I got I can't eat I can't I can't eat uh, I can't eat certain things on on this, on one diet and I gotta eat and certain things I gotta eat on on another diet and I get mixed up and crazy you know. So we tell our patients to not take in a lot of salt or else they become swollen their legs can swell up they can get fluid in their lungs. When I eat even a small twenty five cents bag of potato chips, my legs will swell so much. And I try not to eat beans. And now you know, Puerto Rican not eating beans. So it's like, and I don't drink orange juice. We also ask patients not to eat foods that are very high in potassium. The kidneys remove potassium from the body, and when your kidneys don't work, the potassium level can build up and can be fatal, can stop your heart. Other things like phosphorus can build up and cause bone disease. Within all these issues, and within all the pills you take, 
And then you gotta eat the certain foods and you gotta eat it right and you can't eat too much and you gotta watch high blood pressure. You can't drink too much. French fries, uh, Chinese food, pizza, uh, oh man, everything's salty. I can't eat Frank's, can't eat sausage. But I had some good Italian sausage the other night. Oh. What food do you miss the most that you can't eat? Oh. Melons, uh, the melons. I, you know, when you go away a lot, they have these continental breakfasts. And what they have? Melons, and, you know, and, and honeydew. You know, I might take a little slice, but that's it. Fried chicken, Popeyes. Any kind of fried chicken, but mainly Popeyes. I like that spicy stuff. So it's very important that patients understand that what they eat is extremely uh, relevant to how they feel and how well they you know, can treat their own kidney disease by watching their diet. When I tell people that I'm a nephrologist, a lot of times they say, oh, my liver. Uh, they don't understand that it's the kidneys uh, that, that I study and that uh, alcohol is really more damaging to the liver, not the kidneys per se. Um, so I think there's a lot of misconceptions about why patients end up on dialysis, why they develop kidney failure. I have a lady next door to me now. She's from uh, Mexico. She said to me, where do you go three days a week? She knew the three days a week. I said, why are you writing a book, a mystery? So this is the best ever. She said to me, where do you go? I said, to dialysis. Now she has a son-in-law or a doctor. Most people know what dialysis is for, unless you're living in another world. I said, I go to dialysis. She said, oh, you were drunk. I thought you said you didn't drink. I said, if you don't get out of my face, you will need a doctor. I said, it's for my kidneys, they don't work. Oh, I never heard that. I said, well, we'll go back to school. Diabetes is the number one cause of chronic kidney disease and end-stage renal disease. And most patients who are on dialysis have diabetes. The vascular disease that's associated with diabetes can result in patients having to get leg amputations. Well, it's funny. I mean, they, this particular class now, they, they're getting me with one leg and that's the way I am. And, uh, you know, the only people you really have to explain to are the people who knew you before when you had two legs and then now you have one leg and they look and say, well, what happened? You know, or, Dialysis is this kind of secret in terms of that, you know. Nobody has to know unless you tell them. This is not an uncommon sight uh, to see a patient on dialysis who has lost a leg or a foot. It's not from the dialysis or the kidney disease itself, it's from the diabetes that caused the kidney disease. Uh, when, I, when I first had dialysis, uh, uh, I felt uh, mad, I felt mad, uh, I felt, you know, like, uh, like God didn't want me on it. God didn't want me no more. I, I said, this is the hand that God gave me, this is the hand I'll have to play. But I, in, a, in a way, the, the dialysis is like going to a job three days a week. You don't get paid, but you know, you go to a job. I meet a lot of people here. And they, they, you know what, they, you know, they care, and I care about them, you know, you know, you know, they, they, when I'm feeling down, they, they cheer me up, and they feeling down, I cheer them up. I mean, the people, I think, the nurses and, the, and all that, that's a positive thing. I wasn't raised to, like, be, like, you know, feel sorry for myself or, you know what I'm saying, um, so what? Get up and go. You know what I'm saying? And I mean, like, I, I, I'm like that with my grandkids now, you know? Oh, my, my, my granddaughter's HIV positive. And I'm like, and? And? <laughs> so what? You know what I'm saying? You're still going to school. Oh, I'm sick. And? You know, take your medication and go to school. Do whatever you And, and like, you know, one of the things that I'm glad that I'm here while I'm here, for an example for her. You know, the only thing is that I, I, I'm not working anymore, but they saw me when I worked. What would you say or what advice would you give someone starting dialysis? 
Calm down. Calm down. That's all. Calm down. Sit down and relax. And let the, re let, let the nurse do the rest. Unfortunately, even the best, most compliant dialysis patient still has uh, a very high mortality rate compared to someone who doesn't have kidney disease, who isn't on dialysis. For many patients, though, this is a bridge to a kidney transplantation. And it's worth going through all these things to keep doing what you're doing, to be with your loved ones, and ultimately to get transplanted. For many dialysis patients, dialysis becomes a way of life and they become active participants in their care, but also active members of the dialysis community. This is the registration form for the kidney walk. But for some patients, kidney transplantation isn't an option. And I still think that dialysis has a lot to offer these patients because it provides them with a means of continuing to live. Uh, I'm walking in honor of my aunt who donated a kidney nine years ago. Donated the kidney to me. Yeah, I was on dialysis for a brief amount of time. How long were you on dialysis? About three months. I was one of the lucky ones. There is a house built out of stone. Walk to make people aware of the kidney problems that are happening in New York. And they also raised, I know we raised like $10,000, so. Tables and chairs won by all of them. I want you to be in there, Last year was a sunny, sunny day. The year before was a sunny day. You're gonna see no sweating. It's very cold, it's like a nor'easter today. But um, we're walking over the Brooklyn Bridge. It's one of those things that all Americans should be thinking about because we truly have the ability to give the gift of love. I love this organization. I, I salute every aspect uh, of what it does and I thank you very, very much for being part of this great and joyous event. <laughs> well, I try, I try to keep on a diet, so <laughs> that's all I can tell you, <laughs> I try to keep favorite dietitian. I have to. Oh wait, health. let me put on my shirt. <laughs> she died a month ago, September 18th. Uh, she had some uh, kidney trouble. She was only 64 years old. She went through 10 years of dialysis and she was a very strong woman and this is a memory of her mom today. Dialysis in general is a hard thing to do, but it's life. You're a survivor, you should know, yeah? Yeah, I'm a survivor. Survive. You know, you have to survive. You can't give up. Branches were sown by the color of green. We're walking in memory of my mom that passed away from kidney disease. Five, but she passed away five years ago. So we're walking in memory of her. By the cracks of his skin, I climb to the top. I climb the tree to see the world. When the God yeah, I got a, I had kidney failure when I was 15 years old. Um, my first transplant, my dad gave me a kidney when I was 16. That kidney lasted for about 12 years. Uh, and then in 2002, I got sick again, I had kidney failure. And in 2003, my wife gave me a kidney. Um, and that's what I'm, I still have now, so. You guys have raised more than half a million dollars! And that's 
talk for those who can't get out of their dialysis chair today, we walk on their behalf. Salad. I had a falafel. You know, I didn't like it. They didn't have no sauce on it. Loves you. I love you. Bunches and bunches. Infinity and more. Uno, dos, tres, cuatro. That black boy over there running scared. His old man's in the bottle. Done quit on his nine to five. To drink full time tonight, living in the bottle. See that black boy over there running scared. His old man's got a problem. Pawned off the in there, everything. His woman's wedding ring. Heard that? That was me. <laughs>